Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show with your hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Phil and Ted continue their conversation with magician, TV star, self-proclaimed carny trash and renaissance man, Penn Jillette, the speaking half of Penn and Teller. And now, your sexy boomer hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. And I'm Phil Proctor. We're both sexy. Yes, we are. And we're both still isolated. And before we get started today, we want to remind you that uh, you can come join the party at SexyBoomerShow.com. That's our website where you can hear all the shows and learn the latest news and even find out how you can get our really swell bumper sticker. So let's get ready to hear more from our pen pal. Hello. The one thing about magic that has always impressed me, and I use magic in Fireside Theater, illusions and things like that, it's the sense of wonder. I'm impressed by the skill of the artist, right? But but I'm still, it's like, how do they do that? How, how many hours and hours and hours of practice? Well, you know, the, uh, the, the, the thing that I find um, so interesting is that sense of wonder uh, can be summed up in three words, which is just, I don't know. Yes. And I, I don't know is the scientific revolution. Yes. All science is built on I don't know. Before Copernicus, there was never anyone that said I don't know. The church knew. Yep. The, 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 the uh, kings knew. The dictators knew. Everybody knew. And then science came along and said I don't know. And uh, I believe that those three words... Are uh, are the most important words uh, said in humility, and um, uh, said as a way to solve problems. And uh, let's just hope there's all the people in epidemiology and and, and medicine and in uh, climate studies are using that I don't know to just get that little bit more information that maybe we're hinting this way that can help us all out. I caught on television uh, Fauci, Dr. Fauci speaking, and uh, at the end of this little statement that he made, he said, science is truth. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, uh, I think for speaking for a, for a, for a lay yeah. audience, um, uh, science is a description of things we can, that are repeatable. Correct. And, uh, uh, and, if that keeps being repeatable, that is a pretty good definition. That's a pretty good definition of truth. You could say that again. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I think there's an approximation. You know, the problem is that we've got. Um, uh, it, it is so heartbreaking to sit and write, uh, as we all have, the three-minute speech. That Trump could have given, that would have um, that would have saved so much angst in this country and lives uh, with the Black Lives Matters to simply say uh, yes they do, you know, and that three yep. minute speech that we've all run through our heads that any president would have given. I mean, that Nixon would have given, that Jimmy Carter would have given. Yes, we don't even have to go to Obama and Jefferson. You know, let's let's go. To, let's not go. Let's not go to the impossibly smart ones. Let's just go to the other ones, and let's go to the cynical, insane, alcoholic one, Nixon. <laughs> yes, indeed, he could. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also the um, the you know the perhaps half hour, fifteen minute speech about the coronavirus that could have been given every week while listening to the briefings. That would have done all of that. I mean, um, I think history is certainly going to be able to hang um, tens of thousands of deaths directly on Donald Trump for um, for not wearing a mask, for not talking about, for talking about opening up, and for growing, I believe, growing impatient with his advisors telling him things. You know, um, it, it's. It's remarkable. And uh, I mean, what we wouldn't give for Martin Luther King to be anywhere now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I would like Martin Luther King in charge of the coronavirus. 
I would like Martin Luther King in charge of anything. Uh, but we don't, once again, right now, I will take a, uh, I will take a ticket of Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter and be happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> you worked with Trump when you were doing Celebrity Apprentice. Oh, I sure did. I'm just curious, given your skill set, when you were in the same space with him, watching his ticks and his tells, did you see things that stick with you today when you watch him? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the truth, uh, my truth of Trump, is uh, one that I can't seem to convince anyone of. Hmm. Um, not particularly smart and no shame. Uh, the complete and utter absence of shame is something uh, I said, you know, I was, I was living on the streets for a couple of years. I stayed in biker clubhouses and I never encountered anyone that had absolutely no shame, uh, no embarrassment. Huh. Also, uh, very disconcerting is I spent hours with Trump uh, and other people in the room who were deeply funny, you know, deeply funny. And uh, never once heard Trump laugh. Wow. Uh, now, I, I, don't, I don't mean the mocking laugh of she doesn't have big tits or he's fat or they lost badly. Ha, ha, ha. You can get that, the hollow, empty laugh of the bully. But never the gut laugh of, boy, that's funny. Also, never tapping his foot never any sense of music. Uh -huh. Now, uh, I've seen that before. Um, Doug Stanhope, great comedian, no interest in music whatsoever, but I have never seen, I have never seen someone who, uh, who did not seem to have any sort of sense of humor defined as something other than, than laughing at people less fortunate than you. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and that was so, uh, so strange and so noticeable, you know, so noticeable. Uh, of course, I never dreamed he'd be president of the United States. Um, and uh, consequently, you know, um, uh, Donald Trump Jr. said to me, you're the only person I've ever met who seems to like my father. Oh, uh, <laughs> and that's because I had, uh, I have a very, very... Uh, broad tolerance for eccentricity. Yeah. And I'm really interested in people who live out on the fringes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in wild man Fisher. You know, I'm very interested in tiny Tim, people who uh, truly lived outside the law. And so Trump fascinated me in that way, although it seemed to me to be um, immoral or amoral. Uh, I still had an interest in it, and so I was interested. You know, when Trump was talking, I was interested in that totally unfiltered thing, you know? Mm -hmm. But the no sense of humor and no shame, no embarrassment, none. That's it. None. And uh, it is incredible how much, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of us have spoken about shame as a bad thing. But the complete absence of it, if you are not embarrassed that you don't know something, if you're willing to just make up anything, it is astonishing. And uh, also the fact is, for those of us who know Atlantic City and worked in Atlantic City, um, th there's this really offensive thing where people say that Donald Trump was a good businessman. And they try to say, why do we have a businessman running the country? Well, we don't. <laughs> he, his father left him more money than he had later. I have more money than my father left me. I am a successful businessman. <laughs> Having less money than you were given by your family, there is no planet on which that's a successful business person. <laughs> he went he bankrupted a casino. Three of them. <laughs> where people come in and give you money. They give you money. You cannot fuck up a casino. Once you have a casino, you cannot fuck it up. It's he a cash. It it's a cashino. 
Right, cash it's machine. Right. Like, yes, cash machine. Yes. People come in and give you money. <laughs> they put money into a machine, and then you decide whether they win or not. Yeah, whether they give it back or not, or give any of it back. Right. We decide. Oh. That's what we decide. So you go, how do you fuck that up? So I get very bothered when anybody thinks he has a plan mm -hmm. or that he's a con man mm. or that he's a businessman. Mm. He's none of those things. He is a person who is totally self-absorbed and says things that he wants to believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, magic thinking. Yes, exactly. And if you were able to come up with a perfect lie detector... I believe Trump would pass it all the time. Because he believes it. Yes. It's pathological. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, I never thought he would, uh, he, he would make it, as, nor did he. No. Uh, but I will say, I, I want to brag for a moment sure. and say, there was a time in 2016 when the New York Times compiled Donald Trump's hate list, and I was above Hillary Clinton. Whoa. I was number seven as his most hated person. Number seven? Well, now, why? You, you liked him. Because, well, I liked <laughs> him on that show. And then I went on when he first announced he was running for president. They had me on Lawrence O'Donnell, my friend Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC, had me on the show. And I said, and I mean, I think you'll find this fairly measured. I said, he said, well, you support him for president. And I said, I loved him on a reality show. I really did. I thought he did a fine job being capricious and having no filter is very good qualities for working a reality show on television. It's a pretty good quality for improv. Not a bad quality for that. Uh, and that's what I was doing. I was doing an improvisational show with him. Uh -huh. And I thought he was fairly skilled. But I do not think he, those skills transfer. I think he would be a terrible president and I will not support him. And I said, and I will also hasten to add, there's no one I respect more than Teller. And if he were running for president, I wouldn't support him. I think it's a different skill set. And he then went on a tweet rampage <laughs> about how I, I was unheard of before I did Celebrity Apprentice. Oh, my right? God. Where I tried to point out that the name of the show is Celebrity Apprentice, and if I were unknown, I couldn't be on it, by definition. Uh, he also said that he had heard from everybody that my Broadway show was terrible. And uh, I also said earlier, I must confess, uh, I had said earlier, while I was on the show, by the way, that his hair looked like cotton candy made of piss. <laughs> <laughs> Which, with all due respect to Walt Whitman and Shakespeare, I believe is the most perfect poetic image that's ever been uttered by a human being. And I defy you oh now to look at Donald Trump uh -oh. and think of anything on his hair except cotton candy made of piss. <laughs> you devil, you. You know, being from New York, and uh, I was working in news on in the New York Daily News building when down the street he cut his first deal, which was to make the Hyatt by Grand Central. And he bragged at the time that he basically... Uh, told the banks he had the government, and he, yep. and he told the government he had the banks, and he got the deal. We all know that deal, yeah. And every New Yorker, for the most part, despised him from the very beginning. Sure. And even back in the 70s... At best, he was a joke. At best. Now, I would go to the South in the 70s, and I knew how people were very wary of New Yorkers, fast-talking New Yorkers. And then they ultimately buy into the person that even New Yorkers... Yeah, well, you know, the, the yippies in the um, uh, at the Democratic convention, put Pegasus, uh, they ran a pig for yeah. uh, president. Pegasus. Or was it governor? I don't know. Uh, or mayor, maybe. They ran a pig. And the idea of the pig was not that the pig would do good governance, but that the pig was a fuck you to everybody in the government. I believe Trump was run as Pegasus. And what we never ran the experiment of what if Pegasus wins. And uh, you had so many people. And, I, you know, I'm from a small town in Massachusetts, a dead factory town. Hmm. And I have uh, all the people I grew up with uh, would be hating the elites more than anything. I mean, the elites fucked them over. You know, I would talk to my friends in Hollywood 
Uh, and they said, you know, how, how did Trump get people behind him? And I would say, well, because of you. You went on your situation comedies and you made fun of rednecks and people who live in trailers and white trash. And you did that stuff all the time. It was a big joke to you. And they're fucking human beings. And they're human beings that are suffering. And um, when you have Hillary Clinton talk about a basket of deplorables, yeah. it's heartbreaking. And these people that the elites are talking about are my relatives. You know, and I am, by the way, I am a man over 60 who did not finish high school. I am exactly the demographic. <laughs> and yeah, but there's you a can lot, eat, you know. You can eat fire. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> and I, you know, the, the, the one difference is money, of course. But um, I, uh, uh, I realize this is a too facile understanding of it. But if you send someone to Washington in order to say, fuck you, it's pretty hard for them to screw that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sad irony of it all is that he has enabled those very elites to raid the treasury. Sure, of course. And deregulate. Yes, exactly. Oh, no, no. He's always, he's always in the pocket of the rich. But um, the, the weird thing is, you know, we talk about this, um, how can people possibly vote against their self-interest? How could they possibly vote yeah. against their self-interest? Yeah. You need health care. Why aren't you voting for it? And the very people who say that are the people who are wealthy Hollywood people who are voting against their self-interest because they think there should be a safety net and there should be this and there should be that. So voting against your self-interest is simply compassion. And people who vote against health care when they need it are people who may very well think that, that's, that that is a morally correct thing to do. And those are very complicated things. So I certainly can't explain this. But, um, and I also uh, could not have been more wrong. I mean, my track record tells you, if, you're, if science is repeatable, you need to say, do not listen to Penn Jillette on anything. <laughs> because the, um, the night of the election... When he was winning Florida, I went to work without any doubt in my head that he would lose. Yeah, and me too. And at that point, the numbers told me he was winning. And there is a piece of video. It's so funny because I went to do a show, okay? I left my home at 6.30. I went on stage to play my bass at 8. And I finished up the show at uh, 11.30, no, 10.30. Finish up the show at 10.30. And then I went out to meet people and take pictures. And during that whole time, I am in a bubble. I don't have any news. <laughs> <laughs> and this couple came up, this wonderful couple. Uh, at the end of me taking pictures and signing autographs, and I didn't realize till afterwards that one of them had a iPhone video camera running on me uh -huh. and the other one had their iPhone to hold up to me and they held up the states and the electoral college and Trump had won oh. <laughs> and I went what the f what the fuck <laughs> that, that's impossible that's impossible that, it's, what it's are you impossible. what that's yeah. that, what <laughs> And uh, they just went, we've got it. We've got it. We've got him finding out. <laughs> we've, we've, we've got it on video. And I went, they went, that's what it really looks like. We saw you having to process that. We saw it right there. <laughs> and uh, the other thing was when Donald Trump uh, attacked me in Twitter, I was uh, on the radio doing Opie and Anthony on Sirius uh, uh, Radio. I was on the show, and I'm talking to Opie, and Opie says, uh, Donald Trump has just come out with some tweets against you, the candidate for the President of the United States. And I said, no, he, he, no, he didn't. And they said, let me read them to you. <laughs> and I am sitting in the studio with two cameras on me and a mic in front of me, and he reads a series of four tweets about me by the person who's a Republican 
uh, candidate for president of the United States. And I went, that, 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 what, that, that, is it? What? You at a loss of words? <laughs> and they said, I said, it's exactly as though Abraham Lincoln said four score and seven years ago, there's this magician who really sucks. <laughs> ask not what your country can do for you, but ask why anyone's going to see this fire eater because he's not very good. <laughs> I just said, I, I just can't, I mean, I couldn't even see it as being personal because I could not think of a president, and I, there must be exceptions, I could not think of a president that had commented on an entertainer <laughs> from his bully pulpit. I think LBJ had a thing with plate spinners, but, I, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Well, you know, you've got Nixon saying Manson guilty, but Manson's at least a murderer. Yeah. I mean, do we even have... Um, LBJ saying he doesn't like the Beatles? I mean, or Elvis? There's no, there's no upside. Right. There's no yeah, upside yeah. to that. It's that's right. just, you know, and, um, <laughs> and that's what, you know, that's what, there was a great line. I think Jimmy Fallon said it better than me. You know, Trump, when he was president, tweeted against Jimmy Fallon. And Jimmy said, they asked me what I was going to tweet back. And I said, I just don't have time for this. Wait a minute. Why does he? <laughs> <laughs> it's presidential time, right? He can do anything he wants with it. <laughs> but I really was. I mean, for all time, there is the New York Times saying I am number seven on his most hated list. Wow. Well, congratulations. And Hillary Clinton was eight. You, you are an overachiever. <laughs> Which is one other question I have before we obviously need to let you go. Or I guess not, because <laughs> you don't have anything to do right now. Thank God. That's why we can talk. Actually, Phil, I have the vaccine for the coronavirus. <laughs> I'm just waiting to finish this up so I can get it to people. So, so let's go. Okay, all right. <laughs> when we've had lunch together, the rare occasion that, that we've actually been able to, you know, sit and talk together, I always ask myself, how do you find the time for all of your friends, because you, you, you maintain friendships, and all of your work in so many directions. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I am, uh, if I have one superpower that I'm proud of, is I am able to know what matters to me. Uh, and many people that I'm around don't seem to know, which means I can delegate. Right. I have nothing to do with the Penn and Teller business. Nothing. Uh, uh, Glenn Ally runs everything. And I, I think he said twice a year, I take the reins for something. I don't want to do that or I do want to do that. He makes all the decisions. All the decisions, runs everything. Brilliant. Um, as far as, uh, you know, uh, household uh, decisions and finances, all, all done by my wife. Bless as far her. as taking care of all that, all done by my wife. As far as how the magic is essentially accomplished and the crew, we have had, we're the only ones, by the way, this is true of, we've had the same crew for, I mean, the fucking new guy is 20 years. Wow. Um, these are people who know everything about how we work. And I say, I, I need a kick, 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 and it's there. <laughs> two days later. Um, uh, I don't have anything to do with how things move from one city to another. But more important than that, I also don't worry about it for a second. That's wonderful. I just, if you want to talk about trust exercises, I can drop myself back onto anybody. I really trust people. And so um, I do nothing in a day that I think uh, anybody else could do. So I just do what I do, and I also am crazy, and my family laughs at me. I do everything with a timer in chunks. I do 27 minute, 27 second chunks, where I absolutely work on one thing, and then I meditate for a minute, and then I do another thing, and I just bang those things out. So I get three hunks 
of writing my novel. I get a hunk of base, base practice. I get three hunks of working with Teller. I get a hunk of juggling practice. I get a hunk of card practice. I then do two hours of reading. I then, you know, and I do, dunk, 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 dunk. and I get up and it's like I'm working at the most um, regimented Ford factory that's ever existed. You know, when my friends who write books say, I sit down, I have this ritual, I sit down, open the document, and continue typing where I left off the last second. And when the alarm goes off, I pick my hands up. <laughs> How many days a week do you do this? Seven. So you don't take a day off? No. I, I Before I had a family, uh, my business manager joked, and it was true, before I had a family... Uh, over 10 years that he worked with me, I took one day off. Wow. My mental image of you is just a ball of energy. Well, you know, now I need to and want to. I mean, last year at this time, I took, uh, I took a week and went to Newfoundland with my family. And that's really important to me because uh, before I had a family, time off was not as, uh, as important to me as working. And once I have uh, children, I can I can enjoy my time with them. So I grab uh, I grab I mean this is this is also I think a psychopath talking, but I grab <laughs> my three hour chunks of my children. <laughs> you know, but uh, most fathers have uh, the evening with their family. Right. I don't have that because I'm doing shows. So I pick my children up at school and I, I'm with them until the end of supper. I was a late in life father as well, but I did appreciate the presence of being older with a kid. Oh, you know, I had, like I said, uh, I was born in 1955 and my mother was 45. Mm -hmm. And a woman being 45, having a child in 55 was um, unheard of. Yeah. Uh, and so well, I have a sister 23 years older than me. Mm. Uh, so I, perhaps I wasn't planned. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps uh, they had not said, let's have two children 23 years apart. But um, I believed, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, all, everybody thought I was raised by my grandparents. My, my parents could not have looked less hip. But uh, it felt to me like my parents had dealt with all their problems and they were just there for me. Uh, I think if you, if I'd have tried to have a child when I was 35, uh, I was a, uh, I was uh, obsessed. You know, I, I was doing, um, when the, the time I was 35, I was doing um, Stern, Saturday Night Live, Letterman, and a Broadway show all in the same week. Wow. Uh, and I also put a book out during that time. That's right. Um, and and I, I was on Miami Vice and working on a movie. And I would work uh, pretty constantly 20-hour days. And if uh, I had had a family, I believe I would have uh, given my attention to my family and then resented them. I mean, that's my prediction. Mm -hmm. Whether you like it or not, you're listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. And we'll be right back, God willing. Hiya, Freds. Bob Dog here, sooner and soaper operator of Bob Dog, Dog and Dog, Hot Dog, Sun and Foot Tires, and that means shoes and mean shoes. Means industry. Yes, there's rain on the streets again, and where there's rain, there's rainwashed streets. I ought to know I'm Bob Dog, hi, chick, and it's my privilege to put shoes on your best friend just like he was my own son's car. Here's a pair that'll make the road blush. Wide, they're wider than the car, and safety wrap before their box is stored forever, and that's a long, long time when seconds can make the difference, friends. But don't believe me unless you don't care how much it costs. And I like that kind of man, and if you are, you're the kind of man I like. And I'm going to keep it that way, even if I have to offer you a deal that had to be turned down to be offered to you. And remember this tomorrow when you're awake. You don't have to come to Bob Dog. You can drive around on lemons for all I care. Like they say, if you live in the water, you don't need a boat. But if you do, give me the first chance at its feet and you'll drive away a happy toe. Thanks for looking at me. I'm Bob Dog, and I'll be back. You're listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. To hear all the Sexy Boomer Show episodes and get your hands on our Sexy Boomer bumper sticker, visit SexyBoomerShow.com. Look for Sexy Boomer Show on Twitter and Facebook. 
back to Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet and their special guest, magician and TV host, Penn Gillette of Penn & Teller. We're continuing our conversation with the great Penn Gillette of Penn & Teller. You said earlier you'd never had a drink and you've never smoked pot or no. done any drugs. No. no, not any recreational drugs. I've, I've been hospitalized and been in, in very bad pain and had morphine, but uh, no recreational drugs and not caffeine either. My friend Jamie Alcroft, uh, who had a, a heart and liver transplant recently, uh, he was with Mac and Jamie. They had a TV show for a while. He says, uh, anybody who says laughter is the best medicine has never had a morphine drip. <laughs> well, that is true. That is true. When the pain goes away, yeah. it sure goes away. One of my uh, very good friends was Lou Reed. And Lou and I spent an awful lot of time together. Uh, and uh, Lou would say to me, you know, whenever you want to know about a drug pen, you just come to Uncle Lou. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no drug that I can't explain to you in detail and from every angle. So you don't need to do drugs, pen. You've got me. <laughs> And he did the best radio show ever with Hal Wilner. I mean, just the oh, yeah. best. Well, we, we lost Hal to coronavirus. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. how horrible. I, uh, I, I loved Hal so much. Mm. He, was just, uh, he was just fabulous. Yeah, Hal uh, and, Hal and uh, Lori put together the, the best kind of memorial thing for Lou at the Apollo in New York. It was just, it was just an amazing thing where um, uh, having Paul Simon come out and do Lou Reed songs oh, wow. was just... Uh, just incredible. Uh, I, uh, you know, Laurie Anderson said at the beginning of it, we don't want anybody crying here. And I was backstage, and uh, Paul Simon came backstage after doing his set. And I said, Paul, you, you sure fucked up that not crying thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of doing okay, you know. And then uh, Paul went out and said, you know, uh, in the culture, Lou and I are considered uh, very different. Uh, you know, I was uh, Simon and Garfunkel in pop, and he was the Velvet Underground, and he was all, I was all sweetness, and he was all hate. And But he <laughs> said, we grew up three blocks from each other, and all we listened to was Dion and Doo-Wop, and we're actually the same person. Oh, my wow. goodness. He said, it's just, just the way we're seen. And he said, I'm going to do a song by Lou called Pale Blue Eyes, which is a fabulous song. And he said, the third verse is nonsense and sucks, and it really falls apart there, but I'm going to do it just the way he wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Paul Simon did the most true reading of Pale Blue Eyes that was perfectly Lou Reed and mm. perfectly Paul Simon, mm. and that was it for me. No one could get me to... Uh, I was not anything but blubbering. <laughs> for the... <laughs> I, I held it through Laurie Anderson, you know. I held it through Hal Wilner, but uh, Paul Simon took me down. Speaking of blubbering, uh, how did you lose all that weight? <laughs> <laughs> we know about your potato diet. But where did, where did you get that idea from? Did somebody tell you? Uh, I, can, I, can, I can sum it up. Well, I have friends that were doing... Um, Real heavy research. Uh, they were they were at NASA. They were at NASA, and they were doing real heavy research on the physiology and psychology of weight. And they were trying experiments with things. And I was very early on there, but that's the physiology of it. The psychology was pretty interesting. Uh, I knew that my fr I, I knew that I was uh, at least 110 pounds overweight, and uh, a friend was backstage who knew a lot about this. And uh, he had just taken off 40 or 50 pounds. And he was really knowing a lot about the health of this. And um, we talked backstage. And then a few days later, I called him up and I said, uh, can, you, uh, can you help me lose this weight easily? And he said, no, <laughs> it'll be the hardest thing you've ever done. It'll be really, really, really hard. And I said, uh, I think I need to lose about 30 pounds. And he said, no, you need to lose 110. And it'll be really, really hard. It'll be harder than Broadway. It'll be harder than anything you've ever done. And everybody in the past had said to me, losing weight, here's the easy way to do it. Here's the easy way to do it. And I realized that doing something easy 
never gave me a hard on, <laughs> never pleased me. I realized that nobody ever brags about walking up a grassy slope. They brag about climbing Everest. <laughs> right. And nobody in my life had said to me, being healthy could be really hard. They always said, here's the easy way. The New York Times, you know, can you do a three ounce portion of steak instead of a 10 ounce portion of steak and cut your dessert to a little bit? No, I'm <laughs> never gonna do portion control. Right. I'm a glutton. <laughs> I have to change things at a very, very deep level. And I realized at that moment that not only am I not good at moderation, I don't respect moderation. <laughs> uh, you know, we're coming back to how, uh, why I could find things about Donald Trump to like. I mean, Lou Reed yeah. was not someone good at moderation. Uh, right, that's you right. Know? And when Lou, Reed, when Lou Reed quit heroin, he didn't cut down on it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, uh, once, once I accepted that it was hard, it became really easy. Because I know how to do hard things. Uh huh. That's right. I do. You know, if you tell me here's a six month project that's going to be almost impossible, then I go, okay, let's go. Yeah. But if you say, you know, for the next six months we're kind of going to maybe bowl once a week, it's like, ah, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you do it? Well, you wrote a book about it, by the way, which yeah, people can can buy, yeah. uh, along with yeah. God Know which is another wonderful book uh, that you, you signed for me years ago, uh, and I, I still haven't finished. <laughs> uh, well, you're afraid. Oh, you're afraid I'm afraid. Your afraid. power I'm goes afraid. away. All my beliefs that go right out the window, you know. Uh, God well, help me. Well, it's not me. only that. It's that even if you keep your beliefs, God will punish you for reading it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I do have macular degeneration. So, yeah, exactly. You have a chance. So, so he's he's been at it already. Uh, but what's your diet like now? Uh, uh, whole, I mean, I have a good friend who's a doctor that said, uh, I said, why haven't you written a book? He said, because uh, uh, my book is four words. Eat plants, take walks. Um, I, I eat a uh, whole food plant plant diet. Which means not only, you know, you have to be careful because uh, French fries and beer are vegan, <laughs> but um, they're, not, uh, they're not whole foods. So as close to um, uh, as little preparation as possible, uh, which my wife is, I believe, uh, has become the greatest vegan cook in the country and makes me meals every night that are exciting and interesting. Oh, wonderful. I eat one meal a day. I do intermittent fasting. I eat one meal a day, and I don't need to tell you that I can tell you exactly how many hours between calories I do because I've already given up the kind of personality I am. But last night it was uh, 23 hours and 11 minutes from the end of my <laughs> supper to the next supper. With all the energy you expend, though, when you perform, for example, every night on stage, how do you do that calorically? Uh, calorically, it's about the equivalent of a 5K because I strapped on all the stuff to do that. Uh, Turns out the body is very, very, very efficient. Mm. If you want to uh, gain, uh, if you want to gain 50 pounds over five years, mm -hmm. all you need is a half tablespoon of olive oil a day mm. added to your diet, and that's the way it'll go. So what you need to do is you need to eat um, uh, very, uh, very low caloric high density foods, which is another way of saying vegetables, you know? So, um, so last, last night I had, uh, 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 I had a wonderful cabbage, a uh, big salad, a uh, cooked up cabbage, uh, a little bit of um, uh, chickpeas with, um, with some, uh, with some uh, seasoning on them. And then a uh, obscene amount of blueberries and strawberries. Ah, good, yes. And uh, I've also, uh, your palate changes. I mean, you mentioned the potato thing. The potato thing, the only reason we chose potatoes is because they're funny, it's a funny word <laughs> and a funny image. But I did, a, I did a mono diet for two weeks, which just means no salt and no fat, and essentially, to be blunt, no America. Mm. And uh, 
After two weeks of not having the constant salt and fat, your tolerance has changed tremendously. And I had an ear of corn with nothing on it and could not believe, actually thought that the person that fed it to me had slipped on uh, sugar and salt because it was so incredibly salty and sweet. Mm -hmm. And I remember when, uh, when uh, uh, the scientists I was working with first talked to me, I called them up and said, you know, I get celery out of my refrigerator, and I guess it had been stored in salt water or something because it's crazy salty. And they said, no, 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 no. Celery is crazy salty. Salty. You just don't know it after you've eaten movie popcorn. <laughs> so, um, so you know, you have this. Your tolerances change so tremendously that the salt that's just normally in food is plenty. And that's the thing that you know, uh, people that are on this kind of diet always make the mistake. They have delicious foods and they bring them to a potluck supper, and the people go. I can't taste anything. This is awful. And it's because you do build up, you know, uh, the word addiction is thrown around a lot, but you do build up a phenomenal tolerance. Uh, sugar and fat and salt, the body builds up a huge tolerance for until you really can't taste it except at, at phenomenal doses. Wow. And I keep myself at a, at a dose where I can really taste it. And uh, also, you know... Um, Man, feeling better. You know, I used to have to use willpower to um, stand up and hang out with my children. Oh. I did it, but there was willpower involved. And uh, I think there's a real problem in people who are ambitious and get things done because you can get enormously fat and still get things done with just brute force. Mm -hmm. And one thing that meditation and diet have taught me is that there are other tools available besides brute force. There are other things besides puritanical New England that you can accomplish <laughs> things with. Uh, and that's given me a kind of um, a power of gentleness that I didn't have before. And the payback is energy. Well, just unbelievable amounts. It's not like I have to go, this is what I'm doing now. Right, I can kind of right. go, I'll, I'll do that. I, I think, I'll, think I'll go upstairs. <laughs> so you're not hurling between cravings anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. I learned what hunger is, which is uh, difficult for an American to learn because we think cravings are hunger. Mm -hmm. And the basic rule of thumb, and it's a good one, is if you desire a particular food, you're not hungry. Hmm. If you desire any food, you're hungry. Or another way to put it is, if you don't want an apple, you aren't hungry. And keeping it off requires a literally a lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You have to. You have to be. You have to be a different person, and you have to teach yourself those things. You know, the the the, the Buddhist idea of we're riding an elephant. You know, the, the the subconscious, the body is this elephant, and to try to get that self to move kind of where you want it to mm -hmm. takes a uh, takes a lot of tricks. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I. I didn't think, you know, I didn't think the desire would fall away the way it did. You know, the, the, the guys who worked with me said, listen, once you get this weight down, every couple of weeks you can have a steak. And I went, oh, great. They said, you're not giving up any food forever. And then I said to them, after like two months, I said, you know, I, I don't want a steak. And they said, we know. Uh -huh. We know. We just didn't want to tell you that. <laughs> and I said, uh, I'll never be able to give up cheese. And they said, no, you won't. You never will. <laughs> You'll have to have cheese now and again. And after two years, I said, I have no desire for cheese. <laughs> and they said, we know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we just can't tell you that too early or you'll say, fuck you. You're not taking cheese away from me. And uh, it's really true. Those, those cravings just fall away. When I'm around somebody who's eating, you know, eating lobster dipped in butter, mm -hmm. I sometimes have to avert my eyes. <laughs> sure. It's a, it's a disgusting thing to me. Oh, wow. Interesting. Right. So if you are what you eat, you've completely transformed. If I am what I eat, I'm a bland vegetable. <laughs> no more chocolate? Oh, chocolate you can have, but you have very dark chocolate, which is, uh, which is much more intense and wonderful. But there's a wonderful, you can't go away, you can't go, you, know, you can never beat Emo Phillips as a joke writer. Oh, yeah. You know, Emo, 
Emo Phillips is one of the greatest joke writers ever. And Emo Phillips said, I'm not a vegan because I love animals. I'm a vegan because I hate vegetables. <laughs> Make those plants suffer. <laughs> you know, the jokes that have become jokes that everybody uses are actually Emo Phillips. I'll be darned. Uh, those, uh, those who believe in psychokinesis, raise my hand. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. Oh, that's Emo. That's, that's Emo's joke. That's Emo, Yeah. Uh, I mean, just a perfectly structured joke. And uh, if you want to go the other way, he's also the one who said, uh, you know, I met Mother Teresa the other day. We have the same safe word. <laughs> <laughs> Which is another great joke. Yes. Another great joke. Yeah, I get, I get, you know, I get angry at the... Uh, at the internet because I see all these jokes Uncredited. that are just thrown out there. These are jokes and I go, you know, you can save a lot of time by just saying Stephen Wright, Emo Phillips, and we're done. Yes. Just put those on every joke. <laughs> <laughs> I actually only have one other question because we do have lives I guess we have to get back to. But first of all, this has been absolutely wonderful all the times that we've spent together we've never had an opportunity to talk like this you know so so th this is a good thing from uh you know making lemons out of lemonade <laughs> if you will <laughs> you, know, you know and uh the question i have had to do with your your name uh when it was just the two of you why didn't you call yourselves uh raymond and gillette or pen and ray well, we are the uh, we are like Cheech and Chong, in that we are a comedy team with one first name and one last name. Right. And I used to think we were fairly unique in that, and I went, no, no, Cheech and Chong did the same thing. Uh, I believe it is strictly for well, tr first of all, Teller's name uh, by the time I met him was not Raymond. He uh, had his name legally changed very early. His parents called him Teller. Oh, he did. I didn't know that. I read that he actually legally changed his name to just Teller. He's one of the five people who has one name on their passport, oh, American my passport. Oh, goodness. That's wow. wonderful. Wonderful to know. And, uh, and uh, uh, we originally were going to call ourselves uh, Pendulette and or Teller. And then um, <laughs> the producer in L.A. said, no, no, you're not. No. You're Penn and Teller. <laughs> you're Penn and Teller. That's, 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 that's the end of it. It's, it's just it. It was just the name we, uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, we stuck with uh, on that. How is Teller doing uh, in, in isolation right now? Teller's doing very, very well. Uh, Teller actually had uh, always being uh, ahead, ahead of his peers. Yeah. Teller had health problems before the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he had uh, he had real real back problems that were then cleared up and we were back full force right when the pandemic hit. Oh, oh man, wow! Teller and I have learned um, learned to work over Zoom. We've written um, a bunch of material. The material we're writing now is all without audience participation because we think that might be wise. <laughs> uh, we're also uh, you know we're writing stuff that. Um, uh, doesn't deal with the uh, the pandemic uh, directly, right. but deals with it uh, tangentially. We've done two TV specials from our homes, uh, which is uh, which is pretty wacky. I mean, my wife um, was camera person and makeup and hair, and uh, we did uh, we did everything full broadcast uh, specials with Teller and I split screen and guest stars and you know everything, and it went very well. It's called Try This at Home. Is it available? Uh yeah. It's on CW. It's called Try This at Home. CW. And then Fool Us. Oh, good. The next season, which we got in just under the wire. We just sh finished shooting that right when the uh, pandemic hit. You know, the medium is, is evolving now as a result of having to cope yeah. with yes, this. Yes, indeed. John Oliver is making that little space he's in work with his little background. And I hear people saying, I actually prefer it. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. You know, you're, you're going to have real trouble with, um, with straight fiction drama because it's really hard to tell a story without people in the same room. But uh, for, you know, the new shows, they're never going to go back no. from Zoom. No. I mean, it's, it's so much cheaper. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're, their car, their car budgets just go right away, you know, <laughs> sending black cars to pick up people to do it in their home. And people have learned that vocabulary. And uh, magicians are also learning all sorts of new things. We did a trick. Uh, I was so proud of this. We did a trick with Elle Fanning, 
where we had her, uh, and this was all legit, uh, take a new deck of cards, open a new deck of cards. And while we uh, talked to her, she did a card trick for herself with a new deck of cards and fooled her. Wow. And uh, <laughs> Teller and I worked on that. Jesus, that was a, that was a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Pay no, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Exactly. <laughs> right? If this is going to be a long-term shutdown for the show at the Rio, are you thinking about a way in which to morph it? Yeah, we've been, you know, we've been asked to do uh, corporate shows over Zoom. Uh, a lot of my friends are doing some sort of Zoom shows that I'm showing up in. You know, Puddles, the fabulous clown. Yeah. I just did a hunk on his show. My friend Piff the Magic Dragon. By the way, when I was a child, uh, all I wanted in life was to have a friend named Puddles, a friend named Piff, and a friend named Ratso. And I've got all of those covered. <laughs> Nothing makes me happier than looking at my phone and seeing it say Rats. <laughs> and on top of that, named by Bob Dylan. Who, who do you want to talk to more than that? Oh, Bobby, Bobby Zimmerman, by the way, before he became Bobby uh, uh, yeah. Dylan, uh, apparently worked on building the sets for a show I did in New York called The Amorous Flea. <laughs> How about that? Yes. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> we go way back. Way you back. sure do. <laughs> way, way back. He was, Bob, Bob was working for you, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> kind of a, he was apprenticing. He was, he was, he was apprenticing, apprenticing, building set. I used to hum these tunes, you know, just off the top of my head. <laughs> and he said, hey, I can set that, you know, I got a poem that that'll work for. Yeah. And I just once said to him when he was, when he was doing the carpentry, how many roads must a man walk down before you call him a man? And I, I didn't notice him taking notes, but there you go. That's right. We used we used to when we when we toured our show, uh, we we used to say the sets they are changing, and I you know and I, <laughs> I guess that inspired him. I don't know. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, it's, it's time for a set change, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the internet, I saw this one tidbit in Wikipedia about the Jill Jet and oh yes, and Deborah Harry's connection to it. Yeah. Debbie is Debbie is is the greatest. She is the greatest, one of the greatest human beings ever alive. There, uh, a friend of mine said, was it like 1979 you were listening to the radio and you said, I want to be dating Debbie Harry and have Lou Reed be my best friend? And God just said, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have never met anyone who uh, gave fewer fucks than Debbie Harry. She is the truest punk really? of all time. She is just herself. She is herself with all her might. And still, and still, oh. I, uh, I write emails to her all the time. I, uh, I, lo I love, I, I just love Debbie. And she's such, a, such an incredible inspiration on every front. Whenever you're on stage, if you're not doing it like Debbie Harry, you're doing something wrong. She was just completely, completely there all the time. Fabulous. I used to see her at Max's. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Max's Kansas City. All gone. No CBGB, no Max's Kansas City. Just gone, gone, gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, I did go to CBGB, but not, you know, not quite when you could see the Ramones. I went to see the Ramones once at CB's, and Andy Warhol was in the audience. I don't know if you remember the Dictators, the band. Oh, sure. Hans, handsome Dick Manitoba. Handsome Dick Manitoba. And Animal, do you remember Animal, the bass player? Yep, sure. So I'm watching, <laughs> I'm in the back of the room, wasn't a big room. I'm watching the Ramones. They are incredibly loud, and their 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 stack were loud, actual horns. Mm -hmm. And Animal just strode into the room from the back with his wild hair, and he just walked to the stage, and he stuck his head into the cone of the speaker, and his hair went, <laughs> was waving with the sonic waves. And he just sat there for about three minutes. <laughs> yeah. oh, That's man. what it takes. Here's the other thing that really, really uh, gets me angry. I have hearing aids mm -hmm. from going to see the Ramones and, and Blondie and Lou Reed. And Lou Reed, at the time of his death, perfect hearing. Really? Perfect. Like an 18-year-old. Mm. <laughs> Debbie Harry, right now, at her house in New Jersey, perfect hearing. Wow. Both of them on stage at tremendous volumes. And I just go, how, 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 okay, fine, you win. Yeah. One of the great moments that I saw the dictators was at the Beacon 
Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. It was the Miss Nude Universe contest, hosted by Henny Youngman, <laughs> and the house band were the dictators. You went to heaven, sir. You went to heaven. Yeah, oh. did, right. We participated in the talent part of the show. One of the contestants, her talent that she boasted was that she could flip a quarter off of her breast without her hands. And they needed somebody from the audience, and my friend, of course, volunteered, because we were the only people in the audience. We were like, <laughs> it was the two of us, a couple other people, and every time the dictators stopped playing, they would walk to the back of the beacon about 10 rows behind us and heckle Henny Youngman. <laughs> Henny, Youngman Henny Youngman would play any gig ever. Uh, the story I love about Henny Youngman is when Henny Youngman was doing a gig staying at the hotel, if he walked by a wedding <laughs> or a bar mitzvah or a birthday, he would open the door, go in, find someone and say, I'm Henny Youngman, give me 200 bucks and I'll do five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. He also played a lot of funerals, remember? There was this one, he would, uh, it was an open casket <clears throat> and he was doing his regular kind of eulogy thing. He said he was a wonderful man. He had a, a big family. They loved him. And uh, hey, I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Youngman actually saw one of our first shows in Philadelphia. Oh, he did. And I was doing knife juggling, and I came out and said, Take my knife, please. <laughs> I was amazed because I'm just, you know, just barely could I have had Henny Youngman see yeah, me. You know, yeah, just yeah. barely. Yeah. Now, are you, are you still doing a podcast yourself? Yeah, I do Penn Sunday School. Penn Sunday School. Every Sunday. And uh, I, I enjoy doing it. I love doing it. I went to, to your website, and it looks like you have like 590 shows. Oh, yeah, we've done, we've done a lot. I did, uh, you know, uh, right after Stern got off radio there, I did a radio show, um, National. Uh, and then I went right from that into the podcast. So I've done, uh, I've done, a, I've done a zillion shows. Yeah, well, they're fascinating. I've been listening to a couple of them. They're just great. Such a great conversation. What a pleasure! What a pleasure! Oh, it's been wonderful. Just wonderful catching up with you. And and when the world opens up again, I hope we have a chance yes. to cross paths Let's hang. in person. You know? Let's hang. Give give our love to Teller, will you? I will. I will. Thank you so much. Peace out. Thanks. Wow, what a wonderful conversation. Beyond amazing. Beyond amazing. What a what a what an incredible human being he is. I'm telling you. And he's and it was so generous of him to share so many of his ideas with us and stories. I'm really tickled. Stay secure in your bunker, Phil. Stay healthy. We have more shows to do. Yes, we do, and we'll be doing them until they let us out of here. So this could go on for a while. But we have plenty of really great episodes coming up, so stay tuned. And stay safe. You've been listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, featuring Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet with special guest Penn Gillette. Bob Dog Son and Foot Tires, written and performed by the Firesign Theater. Music by Eddie Betos and the Nervous Brothers. I'm a Ernest Guy. Join us for the next episode of Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, produced by RadioPictures.com, the makers of fine podcasts for boomers. Okay. Okay.